my inspiration for this story was um, uh, born and raised in Detroit, and I'm a huge fan of music. And um, I wanted to do my first documentary, produce, direct it. And so uh, I started doing research about different music in, in the Detroit area. And um, although I had a couple other ideas I started on, um, the roads led back to this story. And I realized that um, it hadn't been told, at least in its complete form. And so I thought, well, you know what? Um, it's an amazing story, and uh, it needs to be told. And it's kind of waiting for someone to do it. Why not me? And, and, and I think any time when you're dealing with documentaries, you're, you go into it knowing that it's going to be a, you've got a length that you've got to tie yourself to, you know? Um, I set a goal of uh, three to five years with it, and it had to be a subject that was going to keep me um, passionate about it. And so uh, music, Detroit, uh, it all blended together. And then, like I said, when finding out that it hadn't been told, I thought, this is time for the definitive. You know, I've been kind of billing it as the greatest untold story in rock and roll history, and I hope it's living up to that. It's a documentary, and I don't think these could be scripted. You know, um, I've worked on quite a few. Uh, I, I don't, because what I'm relying on is the answers coming from my subject, you know. And so um, that turns quite, you know, boom. You know, you get a left turn that you didn't see coming. Originally, this story, um, I keep on saying that it's about the music, but the turn for me was that it was more than the music it became the story of the culture that was built around it. You know, uh, the music got me interested in it, and I realized, wow, this is important, but I really began to see that the real story here was the people that weren't the musicians, the people that weren't on the stage. People attended the Grandy to go to the music, but when they realized what was going on there, they lended their talents in any way they could. They became uh, poster artists for some of the most phenomenal poster art we've ever seen. They became light show operators and um, in the beginning, and, it, and you got to remember this is you know kind of rock and roll in its infancy. You know, before the before the '60s, the the stage was set. And there was just some lights hitting the people, and you know, and and you just went. And this is the first time that musicians are allowed to be creative, and um, play songs that lasted more than three minutes. The story had um, a couple people that, uh, because of how it played out, there was a few people that you need to get into the story. You know, obviously, um, the man that started it, you got to talk to him. You know and uh, the bands that are involved there, you gotta talk to them. But um, what ended up coming out of this was um, the, the people that I knew to interview would say, hey, have you talked to so-and-so? They were a big impact on it. At an international level, there had to be people of relevance. But the other part of this, too, was that they had to want to speak to me Tony, first time producer, director, no films, no distribution, you know, and I'm, you know, and, and one of my biggest faults is I'm, I'm brutally honest with these people telling them that I don't know what's going to happen with this stuff, you know, I don't, you know, I know it's going to be finished, but, you know, I don't know when. And uh, so when I'd contact people, um, their publicists would be a little bit, you know, kind of leery of it. Um, we produced a short trailer early in the project to show the production value that I was bringing to this and kind of the, the story that I wanted to tell, you know, with the few interviews we did. Um, the power of the internet, you know, you could be with a publicist on the phone, you could um, talk to them, get their email, send them a link, ask them to click on that link while you're on the phone with them, get them to view it, you know, get them to, because the artist didn't have a problem with the story. You know, what you run up against as an independent filmmaker is breaking that barrier. The subjects are probably really willing to talk about it, but from a, um, you know, from a PR standpoint, it's kind of difficult 
to say, you know, we're on a major tour and Tony from Detroit wants to interview you for a story that's not <laughs> you know. Right, right. You you grew up in Detroit and, and there is the Grandy being one of the stories. There is so much musical history in the city of Detroit. You know, I had musicians compare it to kind of New Orleans of the north because what you what you have to remember is um, Detroit was built upon um, factories that brought people from all over the country, all over Europe to Detroit to work. And these people worked by day, but at night they wanted to let loose. And so you would find, you know, um, different music coming out, you know, that was special to Detroit, you know. It was a, it was a blues sound that, by way of Alabama, that made it to Hamtramck. There's, you know, um, there's, there's sounds that, you know, um, changed when they got to Detroit because of what was going on. Yeah, you know, uh, that's a tough one. You know, I mean, um, all those Detroit bands, you know, Alice Cooper, Ted Nugent, um, the MC5, um, without the Grandy, Iggy Pop also in that mix, without the Grandy, you know, I don't know if their careers would have went anywhere. You know, Alice Cooper actually played some dates in L.A. and wasn't accepted. You know, L.A. wasn't ready for Alice Cooper. You know, it took a town like Detroit, you know, and um, he calls it home. He calls it the beginning of his stuff, you know. Um, Don was probably one of the greatest record producers alive today, if not just historically. Um, lends his influences from the Knights of the Grandy, you know? And I mean, here we're talking a guy that's produced Bonnie Raitt, Bob Dylan, B.B. King, the Rolling Stones, you know? Um, that's, that's four fingers that I wouldn't mind being any part of. I mean, that's amazing, you know? And, and this is where he saw, his, this is where, what influenced his, his producing styles, you know? I think, um, I think Tom Wright says it best about the Who, that you know, they were coming off a first American tour, and it wasn't going the way they anticipated. They were billed with people that weren't of that caliber of that same type of music, and uh, when they got to Detroit, you know, all hell broke loose, and um, you know, it kept them going enough where they wanted to premiere Tommy, you know, at a place like the Grandy. It could have been anywhere. Oh, I think Detroit's totally trending now. I think it's, um, you know, uh, the, the festival itself it lays testament to it, you know. Um, I don't think there was a, um, and you know, maybe you guys could answer this better than me. I don't think that there was a, a thought of, hey, let's get, let's make the 2012 uh, Traverse City Film Festival about um, Detroit. I think that uh, Detroit had so many great stories to tell and they were so well done by some incredible uh, um, filmmakers that it made a presence this year.